Okay, so we're going to start to look at um, conditional probabilities. And when you see a conditional probability, you'll see it denoted with this vertical bar that's hanging out inside your parentheses. And I just want to note that we're picking up the second of our major formulas. And I say the major formulas because these first two you can always use regardless of the problem. And here comes the second formula. We're going to call it the multiplication rule in a bit. This is called the addition rule, multiplication rule. Okay. So you're allowed to use that formula when you have a conditional probability. So let's learn about those. So let A and B be two events where the probability of B is strictly greater than zero. Or specifically, the probability of B is not allowed to equal zero exactly because it's going to be in a denominator and you can't divide by zero in math. So the conditional probability of the event A, given that the event B has occurred, denoted by the probability of A, vertical bar B, is this formula. So let's try and deconstruct this a bit. When you see this symbol, the A with the vertical bar and then the B, we would say this out loud as A given B. So in terms of the probability of A given B, it splits into its own ratio. Um, this numerator is the probability of A and B, and this denominator is the probability of B. Uh, so this overall probability, the probability of A and B, you need a probability in a numerator and a probability in a denominator. And there's going to be plenty of times where this numerator is a fraction or a decimal, and this denominator is also a fraction or a decimal. So we'll have to do a fraction divided by a fraction, or a fraction divided by a decimal, decimal divided by a fraction, some version of that. That will happen plenty of times. And in terms of what this means, A given B, um, this could be what is the probability that you are a STEM major given you are female. Or I could have asked it the other way around. What's the probability that you are female given you are a STEM major? So this given, this thing, this event that comes after the vertical bar, this has already happened. This isn't up for question. Event B happened. And given event B happened, then what's the likelihood that A will also happen? That's what we're trying to, to calculate here. So um, given you live in Hayward, what is the probability that you own a home? Something to that effect. All right, so something has definitely occurred. And with that piece of information, now that we know B has occurred, event B has definitely occurred, then what's the likelihood A would also occur? So your condition comes after the vertical bar. So the crap in parentheses, right, A given B, this is a conditional sentence, A given B. And even though it's not really a fraction inside this parentheses, I kind of, um, it always helped me to remember that if you thought of this as numerator, fraction bar, denominator, this letter here, whatever was after that, that vertical bar went to the denominator. So it helped me in remembering, okay, whatever's after the vertical bar shows up in the denominator, and we've got the probability of A and B here. All right, and I, you'll always have this formula with you. I just wanted to give you some ideas. All right, so let's take a look at example five again. An experiment consists of randomly selecting one digit from a table to find event A, we had those, and event B, and just to remind ourselves, let's write the sample space here. So that was all our single digits, 0, 1, 2, all the way up to 9. Okay. And let's start to play this formula out. So the, the way the letters are written in the parentheses here, they, act, they completely map to how this formula is written. So I've got my right parentheses, I'm going to put the equal sign. I'm going to put my numerator, probability of A and B, denominator, probability of B. And I'm just going to count all of these. So this says get me A and B and find me its probability. Now we've talked about this for a couple of examples, but let's review it. So if you see A and B, what's in event A and B? Well, I've got my separate list for A and B. They're separated by the word and. All right, and try to think to yourself, did and mean combine? Or did and mean overlap? And and is overlap, right? It's the very exclusive one. It has shorter lists. So let's see what outcomes were in A and B. If I look at it, it was just the numbers 3, 4, and 5. So what is the probability of A and B? Well, there are three outcomes favorable to it out of 10 outcomes total. So my numerator is a fraction. 
Now that denominator should be the probability of B. So if I'm looking at the probability of B, well, let's count up. There are four outcomes, one, two, three, four, in event B out of 10. And as we start to move through this, if you go back to your math days or even our math interlude, when you had a fraction divided by a fraction, we would multiply by the reciprocal of that denominator. So I'm going to do 3 fourths, excuse me, 3 tenths times 10 fourths. So I'm going to multiply by the reciprocal of that denominator. And then we also talked about in the math interlude, and you might remember from your math days, that you can cancel fractions or I should say you can divide, right? You have a 10 in the numerator and 10 in denominator and ratio, that would be one, so they cancel out. So we're looking at 3 fourths or the decimal 0.75, okay? And let's start to try and get some feels for this. Where is this coming from? All right, they're telling us event B happened. So I went to my random digit table and I definitely picked one of these three, um, sorry, one of these four digits. I either picked a three, four, five, or six. Event B happened. This isn't up for question, it happened. So given I've picked a three, four, five, or six, those four options, note it's in the denominator, out of those four options, what was the likelihood I also picked a digit that was in A? Well, three of those four options are in A. That's why we're getting that 75% chance. All right, let's look at it from the other side of things. What if I had flipped the letters B given A? All right, and I want you to note they're in reverse order. So when it comes to this formula, I hit this too many times, let me erase this. When it comes to this formula, I don't want you to memorize that the letter A has to go here and the letter B has to go here. Don't marry yourself to the letters, marry yourself to the position. Whatever letter is in this position goes to the denominator here. Whatever letter is in this position, you only see it up in the numerator. So if I'm looking at the probability of B given A, this second calculation I'm asking you to make, Let's make our fraction. So if it's B given A, this will say B and A on the numerator. And again, marry yourself to the position. A is the letter behind the vertical bar. Whatever letter is behind the vertical bar gets put into your denominator. So we will have the probability of A here. Okay, great. Now if you remember from before, A and B, same thing as B and A, doesn't matter. All right, so A and B had three outcomes out of 10. All right, what was the likelihood A would happen? There were one, two, three, four, five, six outcomes out of my 10. So this is gonna become 3 tenths times 10 sixths. Again, we can divide out those tenths or cancel them, if you will. And we've got three out of six or 50%. So there's the, the numbers, the calculations, but let's think about what it means. It's telling me A happened. So when I went to my random digit table, I definitely got a zero, one, two, three, four, or five. That happened. Out of those numbers, how many were also in B? Well, about half of them were. So half were in B, half weren't. That's why I had about a 50% chance of event B occurring. So if you know you pick a digit, zero, one, two, three, four, five, there's about a 50% chance that you also picked a digit that was in B. All right, so continuing on with that, we're gonna scooch the page up and we're gonna to start to look at independent and mutually exclusive events. So let me move this up so it's looking all nice. All right, so we've got independent and mutually exclusive events. So when we start to pick these formulas, up, or not these formulas, these vocab terms up, excuse me, I wanna flip back to that formula sheet. So when we hear our events independent, um, you're gonna use equations three or four, all right? If you hear mutually exclusive or disjoint, you're gonna use equation five. And it can, the question can come to you in a couple of ways. So I might ask you, are events independent? Are they independent or are they not independent? If I ask you to prove or disprove whether events are independent, choose one of these formulas and see if equality holds, all right? So choose, is the probability of A given B equal to the probability of A? If this is true, then you would say, yes, the events are independent. If this is not true, then the answer would be no, these events are not independent. All right, and same on the disjoint end. If I ask you, hey, are these events independent? Excuse me, are these events disjoint? Check and see, is the probability of A and B equal to zero? If it is, then the answer is yes, they are disjoint. If this equality doesn't hold, then the answer is no, they are not disjoint. So 
One version of the question is where I ask you to prove or disprove independence, prove or disprove disjoint slash mutually exclusive, and then you see if equality holds. Um, the other version is when I just straight up tell you the events are independent. If I tell you they're independent, you get to use these equations at will in addition to these two. Right? If I tell you the events are disjoint, you get to use this formula just for fun in addition to these two. Um, and when it comes to three and four, I tend to use four more often. Uh, and I'm going to show you both versions where I use equation three and I use equation four just so you can see them, um, see what your personal preference is. I think I like formula four better because I mentioned before the and, it's in a bunch of the formulas, right? It's in formula one, two, four, and five. So I'm just very used to finding the and and using it to prove or disprove things, which isn't to say I won't use equation three every now and again, and that I should use equation three in some instances. And again, we'll, we'll do both ways. You find your personal preference and, and stick to it. Okay, so moving along from there, let's see if we can get some definitions going and calculate some probabilities. So two events that have no common outcomes are said to be disjoint or mutually exclusive. That is, A and B have no outcomes in common, that's what that symbol's saying, okay? Or the probability of A and B is equal to zero. So that's formula five right there. And you might be thinking, well, what are some events that are disjoint or mutually exclusive? So let me just do a couple, for instances, um, over here. So let's say we were gonna roll a die. This was our very first example. We said our sample space, if I was gonna roll one dice, I'm just gonna do it. one die, regular old die, sample space, one, two, three, four, five, or six. Let's call event A rolling an even, and event B rolling an odd. All right, so if I wanted to talk about the outcomes here, it would be two, four, six. Here it would be one, three, five. So if that's the case, I want you to think, what will go into A and B? All right, so you've got your list for A and you've got your list for B. They're separated by the word and. Does and mean combine or does and mean overlap? And we go, okay, and means overlap. So where do these overlap? You're starting to see they don't overlap. That's why we put that symbol there. All right, so since there's no overlap, we would call those mutually exclusive or you might use the phrase disjoint. They're interchangeable, it doesn't matter which one you use. But again, take a step back. If you're rolling one die, you can't roll an odd and an even at the same time. That's impossible, so we call that mutually exclusive, okay? On the flip of that, let's pick up independent. So two events are independent if the occurrence of one does not alter the probability of the other. And then two formulas that you can use to prove independence or to calculate probabilities of independent events are right here. All right, so we've got the conditional version and the and version. Um, now let's think about these two events. Now this, in this case, I'm gonna roll one die and then I'm gonna roll a second die. So I'm gonna have two, two iterations of rolling die. And I want you to think about this. If I roll the die first, roll it, all right? Does rolling an even on your first die alter the probability of rolling an odd on your second die? So if I roll a two for my first um, die roll, does that have any bearing? Does that lower the probability of rolling an odd or raise the probability of rolling an odd the second time out? No, all right, I could roll an even and that has no effect on what I'm gonna roll next. So while A and B are mutually exclusive, I could also say A and B are independent here, okay? All right, but let's play it out with this random digit experiment. So we've got an experiment consisting of randomly selecting one digit from a table and we're gonna define event A to be our, our standard six outcomes, there's event B, just for fun, I'm gonna write my sample space. Okay, and here we go. Are A and B independent? I'm gonna head over to my formulas, all right? So now I'm gonna do formula four first, and then I'm gonna show you this with formula three. So let me write down formula four. All right, so are A and B independent? So is the probability of A and B, I'm gonna put a question mark over it, equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. So I wanna see if equality holds, okay? Now as I start to do this one, we've talked about A and B a bunch, right? So let me write A and B here 
it's always 3, 4, 5. So what was the probability of A and B? It was 3 out of 10. I'm going to put equals with a question mark over it. So let's see if it's equal to the probability of A times the probability of B. Now the probability of A, there was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So there was 6 out of 10 chance of probability of A. Let's see for probability of B, there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 4 out of 10. Okay. So once I get those three numbers, I, I'm going to figure out, hey, are they independent? Let, let me just crunch this. So I'm going to do the right side of the equation first. So if we look at it, I'm looking at 6 out of 10 times 4 out of 10, and that looks like it's about 0.24. So I know the right side of my equation is 0.24, and I know the left side is 0 0.30. And then you ask yourself, is 0 0.30 equal to 0.24? And the answer is no, I'm gonna put a slash through that. So the answer to this question is no, these events are not independent. So if I write this up, I would say something like, therefore, A and B, oops, I always do that. A and B are not independent. Okay. And this time I happen to use formula four. All right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna scooch the page down just a little bit, and we're gonna retry this, and we're gonna use formula three, just so you can see both versions. All right, so if I was going to use formula three. I want to ask myself, is the probability of A given B equal to the probability of A? And I'm going to put a little question mark over that. If equality holds, they're independent. If equality doesn't hold, they're not independent. And just FYI, if, if equality didn't hold on four, it was not, it's not going to hold on three. All right, these should always lead to the same conclusion. So I already found out they weren't independent. I should be able to draw the same conclusion from here. So I want to know, is the probability of A given B equal to the probability of A? All right, well, let's do this. I did calculate the probability of A. We did that up top when we revisited example 5. We knew that number was 0.75. Okay. We've done the probability of A a bunch. All right, the probability of A is 6 out of 10. So if I look at this, is it true? Is 0.75 equal to 0 0.60? And the answer is no, right? Those are not independent, so I'm gonna put a slash through that equal sign. So again, even using this version, I find out A and B are not independent. Okay, so this one was, here I used formula four. Here I used formula three. All right. They both led me to the same conclusions, and they should. I mean, the events are either independent or not, and in this case, they're not. Okay, great. I just, I, for whatever reason, not whatever, I know why. Because the and is so common to all the probability formulas, I tend to use formula four more than formula three. And really, it's actually faster to go with formula three. I just happen to like formula four. All right, in terms of are these things mutually exclusive? Well, mutually exclusive is another word for disjoint, so here's where I'm gonna apply formula five. So let's take a look at this. Is it true? Is the probability of A and B equal to zero? All right, let's try it. So the probability of A and B, we know it, right? It's three out of 10. Is that equal to zero? Well, 0 0.30 does not equal zero. All right, so since equality did not hold, the answer to this question is no, they are not mutually exclusive. And another word for mutually exclusive is disjoint. And they're not mutually exclusive because both can happen at the same time. If I'm picking a random digit off of the digit table, if I pick 
a three, four, or five, it's in B and an A. It's in both of them at the same time. So it's possible to pick one digit from the random digit table and light up both events. Okay. So there's our, our look at all of our formulas now, right? So we've picked these up. We've talked about all five formulas, and all we've been doing is counting. We've been doing basically a counting problem where we count the number of outcomes um, in our experiment, and, and we match them with these formulas. So as we start to move forward, we're going to pick up these other three methods. I'm going to talk about other counting methods. Um, I want us to make sure we can count decks of cards and that we can count um, when I roll two dice. So we've done at this point a counting problem with all five of these formulas. We've taken a look at the OR, we've taken a look at the conditional, we've taken a look at independent events and disjoint events.